Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Harry S. Truman became the 33rd president of the United States after the unforeseen death of his predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, on April 12, 1945. Truman, who rarely interacted with Roosevelt during his brief time as his vice president, was suddenly left in charge of his country during the waning days of World War II, when decisions had to be made about the future of war-devastated Europe, the rise of communism, and the use of the atomic bomb to bring an end to the war in the Pacific. In this episode, our guest, Clifton Truman Daniel, eldest grandson of Harry Truman, will be speaking with us about his grandfather's life and presidency. Clifton is the honorary chairman of the board of the Truman Library Institute and is an author, lecturer, and actor. He is currently portraying his grandfather in the play Give Him Hell Harry by Samuel Galou. I'd now like to welcome Clifton Truman Daniel to our show. Welcome, Clifton. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. Well, it's really great to have you on this show because, as I've mentioned on a lot of my other podcasts, I'm a huge history buff, particularly presidential history, and Harry Truman is uh, just a, a, r- a real favorite of mine. It's a real pleasure to have you just to learn a little bit of what it's like being a member of the Truman family. I'd like to start off by asking you, Clifton, where were you born and raised, and what can you tell us about your, your immediate family? Um, born and raised in Manhattan, New York, my mother, when she was a singer, my mother, Margaret Truman, when she was a singer, radio personality in the 40s and 50s, she lived on and off when she was in New York. She lived at the Carlisle Hotel at the corner of 76th and Madison. She kept an apartment there and she met uh, my father in 19, I think they met in 1955. They were married in 1956. And mom had just published her memoir, which is, uh, it's it's Souvenir or My Own Story. I think it's, I can't remember which one it is in the UK and which one in the US, but she published the memoir. And with the proceeds from that memoir, she and dad bought an apartment at 76th and Park, a whole block from the Carlisle. Hmm. And that's where I grew up corner of 76 and park so your whole early life was spent there yeah first 26 years i didn't uh i mean i i went away to college and i you know i had apartments on my own on and off uh, and lived at home on and off and finally left for good when i was 26 years old in 19 oh my god 1983 (laughs) (laughs) so you're a new yorker so uh i'm only yeah yeah i'm i'm only about 20 miles outside of Manhattan. So uh, we we grew up kind of close to each other, actually. Where where are you? I grew up in Essex County, New Jersey, which is where I live now. And we often go into New York for one reason or another. So I know the area that you're talking about. Now, Clifton, what can you tell us about your dad? My father, when my parents met, dad was the assistant to the foreign editor of the New York Times. He had come back, he had been the Times' man in Moscow for a number of years. And and there's actually a good story about behind that. Um, He'd been working in Moscow and dealing with the Soviet bureaucracy, Mm -hmm. which had given him an ulcer, as I'm sure it gives many Westerners an ulcer. And mom and dad met, were dating, and my grandparents were in New York staying at the Carlisle. And my mother took my father to introduce him to her parents. And they went around the room and I'm sure mom asked everybody what they want to drink. I'm sure my grandparents said bourbon. Uh, My mother used to like to drink gin and tonics. And she said, Clifton, what do you want? And of course my father said, I'll just take a glass of milk. And my grandfather He uh, appreciated people who could hold their liquor and, you know, he himself drank sparingly, despite some of the the ideas to the contrary. 
he appreciated people who could hold their liquor. He did not trust teetotalers. And here's this new guy dating his daughter who wants a glass of milk. So his brow furrowed and his face clouded. And my mother very quickly said, no, 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 dad, it's okay. <laughs> He's sick. Uh, you know, he has an ulcer. <laughs> so grandpa's like, oh, well, that's all right, dad. As long as he has an excuse for drinking that stuff. That explains it. That explains it. So that's, yeah, that's how, that's how they met. They, I think my mother told me years ago that they met at a cocktail party and she had, she was on the arm of her escort for the evening was Dorothy Parker's husband. I don't know why he wasn't escorting Dorothy, but uh, mom never got into that. That's interesting. So I have three daughters and I have three sons-in-law. And I know that when I met these young men that I wanted to make sure that they were good enough for my daughters. So I'm just imagining your dad had to go in front of Harry Truman to get the hand of or ask for the hand of Harry Truman's only daughter, only child. What was that like for your dad? Did he ever share anything about that? He didn't. Uh, the only, uh, I asked dad years and years ago, I mean, I, I, I assumed, I said, you know, it looked like you always got along with grandpa. And he said, yeah. But he said he was the perfect father-in-law. He, he kept his nose out of my business. And the two of them uh, shared, uh, she was their only daughter, but she knew her own mind. And, you know, she had been away from home. She pursued a music career. She traveled. She was away from the White House, away from them a lot. She she did her own thing. But dad always said that that uh, he and grandpa got along great. They shared a love of clothing. Both of them were clothes horses. You know, my grandfather had been a haberdasher. He always wore very stylish suits, neckties, shirts. He loved clothing. Dad did, too. Dad, because dad spent part of World War II and some time after in England, he bought all his suits on Savile Row even well into his, you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, we, we, we cleared out his closet after he died, Savile Row, in one label after another. And it's, yeah, it's a shame that they didn't, none of them fit me, because um, those are nice suits. So they shared that. They, they just, they got along uh, really well. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Now I'm thinking, when did your dad pass away, actually? Cliff? Dad died in 2000. 2000 and how about your mom mom died in 2008 2008 so you had them you had them for a good long time yeah dad was dad was 87 mom was 83 there was about there was almost 12 years between them when they married uh, clifton uh, i think you're just about the same age as i am so you grew up in the 70s and tell me your father never let you buy a leisure suit <laughs> Uh, dad never had to worry about that. I never wanted a leisure suit. <laughs> Thank goodness. I was, I, I, disco, no offense to everyone out there who likes disco and wore leisure suits and puka beads and white shoes. That's all good to each his own. But disco nearly killed me. I was listening to the Almond Brothers and, you know, <laughs> uh, Led Zeppelin. And then here comes John Travolta in the white suit. And, the, and I thought, ooh, no. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't me or my immediate circle of friends, so. So let's talk about the 70s or that era. So uh, talk about education. So where did you end up going to school? Did you go away to college? Were you in the city? Yeah, I went, well, I went to, for prep school, I did what, you know, all of the, uh, all of the kids of my ilk on Park Avenue did. We were all, we were all bundled off to prep schools in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. I went to Milton Academy in Milton, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and from there to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which was my father's alma mater. I, I only lasted two years at Chapel Hill and came home with the stated goal of becoming an actor mm -hmm. and basically futzed around New York for a few years before leaving uh, you know, in, in 1983 uh, to go work for a New York Times Zone newspaper in Wilmington, North Carolina. Terrific. So you had that journalist in your blood? Yeah. I, well, it, weirdly, I remember growing up thinking, I, you know, I'm not going to be my parents. I'm not going to do what my parents do. Yes, I am. I, I, a journalist and an actor. You know, what happened? Somewhere 
you know, all, all of my standoffishness got completely derailed. I am my parents. Yeah, we all are in some. I know it's just well, you. You never think you're going to go in that direction. You, you look in the mirror one day, and not only are you uh, uh, career-wise, but you're starting to look like them. Yes, exactly. But I, I look quite a bit like my dad, but my dad had hair and I don't. So <laughs> that's where we differ. <laughs> we had, we had, when I was in prep school, I, of course, in the seventies, I had hair well down over my shoulders and I was walking by uh, one of the older kids and his father were packing up the car to go off for a weekend or something. And the father started snickering when he saw me and the son said, what is so funny? And the father said, that kid walking by looks like Margaret Truman. <laughs> Worst, worst thing in the world for a 16 year old to be told that he looks like his mother. Yeah. yeah. Did you keep the, uh, the hair after that? Yeah, that wasn't going to stop me. Nope. Sorry. Cause there were too many, there were too many other things aligned against my hair. My mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandfather hated long hair. My grandmother didn't like it. So I think fine. I mean, you, you people aren't going to get the better of me. No. Yeah, I think I have to stop you here to ask. I, I remember you telling me in a previous conversation that um, I think your your grandfather or your grandfather and grandmother made observations about your hair. Yeah, well, Grandpa, uh, the first time he ever saw us with long hair was the year before he died. We went out there at Christmas time, I think it was. And, and both my younger brother, Will, and I had our hair grown down to our shoulders with my mother's sort of tacit approval. I mean, she she and dad just didn't want that fight you know, they really didn't like it all that much but they didn't they didn't want to have that was that you know it was a pick your battle situation let's just leave that one alone let's try and keep him off drugs and cigarettes first before we mess with his hair so i grandpa we we forgot to check in with grandpa you you're, you come in through the kitchen family comes in from the back through the kitchen coming through the kitchen and you go right past the study and the first thing you're supposed to do is stick your head in or walk all the way in and say hi grandpa make sure you said hello well we skipped that step we just went right upstairs and he just saw us go by the door and came out from around behind his desk and when my mother walked through he said who are those two long hairs walking through my house and my mother swallowed hard and said <laughs> those are your grandsons and he said well they didn't say hello get them back down here and mom yelled up the stairs and we had to come back down stand in front of grandpa and say hi he was not happy he one because we ignored him and two because we were a couple of hippies long hairs in his house i thought my grandmother was different a couple of years after grandpa died she came to see us in washington dc where we were living at the time and by that time my hair was you know down the middle of my back and i came down to breakfast and i got a bowl of cereal and i sat with my grandmother in the window nook my mother was making breakfast for one of my brothers across the kitchen. And my grandmother very loudly said, my goodness, you have beautiful hair. And my mother swung around from the stove and said, mother, don't tell him that for God's sake. He'll never get it cut now. True. Next time my mother suggested I go visit a barber, I said, no, best Truman likes my hair. <laughs> you know, good enough, right? Yeah, it's good enough. But I but the Truman Library gave me a letter years and years after that. I told that story a number of times, and they gave me an actual letter that my grandmother had written to her friend Mary Bastian. And in the middle of the letter, she says, I'm so sorry our friend's having so much trouble with all those hippies. Seems something ought to be done about them. When I saw my two grandsons with long hair, I nearly expired. Thank God they were clean and had on good clothing. She hated it every bit as much as grandpa, but she was willing to overlook that just to annoy my mother. Oh, that was the objective. Yeah. The objective was just making life hard for her only child. Her only child. <laughs> wow. wow. So Clifton, you, you talked about that experience with your grandfather. What was it like being Harry Truman's grandson? And that is while, while he was living, what was your interaction with him? Um, he was grandpa for the most part. My, my parents, uh, they didn't tell me he'd been President of the United States, I found out in school. I went to class the first day of first grade and, and we all introduced ourselves and I didn't say anything except, you know, Clifton Daniel. We we're all supposed to say a few words about who, you know, who our parents were. And the teacher said, well, wasn't your grandfather President of the United States? And I said, I don't know. News to me. So I went home that afternoon. My mother loved telling this story. I dropped my book bag at the door. And I marched across the living room floor and I put my hands on my hips and I said, Mom, did you know 
that Grandpa Truman had been president? She said, yes, but just remember something. Any little boy's grandfather can be president. Don't let it go to your head. But even then, it, that, that didn't mean anything to me. Six years old, I'm like, yeah, okay, great. As I got older, it was fun traveling with him because by that time, he didn't get Secret Service protection until after JFK was assassinated. So I think 1964 was when he first had Secret Service protection. But everywhere you went with Grandpa, doors were opened. You, you, know, you got in the back door, you sat in the front row, you got the first seats, all of that. Um, private planes, limousines, all of that business. My, my late brother, William, we were traveling with Grandpa, I think going to Key West, which involved a, a few different vehicles. And so we were on a plane and then there was a limo and then there was a private plane and another limo. And Will turned to dad and said, are we getting richer? And dad said, no, we're just traveling with your grandfather. Ah, that explains it. So it got to be, you know, it was fun. It was fun to, to be around them because you always did something, uh, something interesting. But uh, the rest of the time, we, they were just Gammy and Grandpa. We were at the, you know, at the house in Independence, trying not to get in too much trouble. They're just grandparents. Was he a, a person with a good sense of humor? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I only discovered that really when long after he had died and I was older. I was in my 30s, and I really began to read and reread about him, join the, st join the board of the Truman Library, all of that. When we were kids... He, he could be fun. I mean, there, I have pictures of me climbing on him when I'm three or four years old and we're all smiling. So he could be a lot of fun, but he could also, you know, he liked his peace and quiet. He could also be stern. You know, if you were running through the house making a racket, you got stopped. Um, but never, never unkind. It was just, you know, lay down, lay down the law. Yeah. Well, I think of it that your grandfather was born, I believe, in 1884. So he was a, a Victorian era child. Uh, yep. And I would imagine that his view about how children should act in the, in the home around adults was probably of that era. Well, and, I, and now that I think about it, uh, completely two-faced, because I can't imagine that my mother was that well-behaved. <laughs> She was, you know, uh, the, the story that she always used to tell, is my grandmother was stumped one day because mom stopped eating dinner. She just, there's nothing wrong with her. She just wasn't hungry. She just pushed her plate away. My grandmother had to fight with her and fight with her. Well, she found out that what mom was doing had discovered a route that before dinner, she would run next door to her aunt and uncle's houses. They both, both uncles lived next door. Or she'd run to her uncle uh, Fred, who was living in the house. She'd make the rounds of the aunt and uncles who everybody gave her a cookie or a cake or a treat or something. She was full by the time dinner rolled around. Really? So she was, yeah. I, so I can't imagine that. Uh, I don't know why grandpa was so stern with me. Maybe it's because he, maybe because mom wore him out. I don't know. <laughs> that, that could be. Could be. What do you recall about, you know, any discussions that you had with your grandfather? Do you remember ever sitting and talking with him about things in general? Um, only once, you know, again, we were, we were young, uh, and he was at that point, he was, you know, in his late seventies, early eighties. And I said, he, you know, he liked his peace and quiet. He, I mean, we, you know, we could sit around and, and talk to him if we wanted to, but we were mostly more interested in finding something to get into in the attic right? or oh God, we got on the roof once we were always trying to find some way to cause trouble. And the only time that the time that I remember sitting down with him for a discussion, we had driven out to Independence. My father and mother threw us in the car and we drove, stopping off at Colonial Williamsburg and uh, Gettysburg on the way. Great battlefields, yeah. And I loved Gettysburg. I mean, I like Williamsburg too, but I loved being able to walk the battlefield and stand on a little round top and look into the Devil's Den and, uh, you know, stand in the field, uh, Pickett's Charge, all of that. So I, uh, we got to independence and I just wandered through grandpa's study and looked on the show, just looking for civil war books. And I found several books, including a uh, big coffee table book of Matthew Brady photographs. And well, I guess they were all tin types, all different daguerreotype photos. And I just thought, whoa, and the battlefield at Gettysburg, Antietam, it was sadly, a lot of it was post-battle. So they were, there were a lot of pictures of, corpses 
but I was fascinated with you know matching up where I had been and and looking at the photos and and reading about again what had happened at each place and grandpa walked in <laughs> probably right off the bat wondered why his grandson had dumped half of a bookshelf out on the floor and uh, realized what I was doing and I don't remember much of what said I just remember uh, thinking God he knows a lot about this I mean he, he just we just talked about the battle for a few minutes you know how did you like the battlefield cool it was cool so that's one of that's I think the only historic only history conversation we ever had do you recall the last time that you saw your grandfather um, it, the, the last time I saw him must have been that, um, it, I think it was that incident where he, the two long hairs walking through the house. I was 14 and he died when I was 15. I turned 15 in June. He died that December. Mm. And I don't remember, he, but he was getting more and more frail. I don't think that, that I saw him past that last time when we failed to speak to him first before going upstairs. We did not do Key West that year. He died in 1972. Last time we were in Key West together was 69. So we did not do uh, Key West. And I, I don't, we didn't go out there for Christmas. You know, Christmas is when he was ill. I mean, he was in the hospital through, because he died the day after Christmas. So he was in the hospital before, but we, we didn't go out there to see him. And I don't, we didn't go at Thanksgiving and I don't, and we didn't go to Key West, so I think. When I was 14 was the last time I saw him. Now, your grandmother, Bess Truman, former first lady, she outlived your grandfather by quite a few years, didn't she? 10 years. Yeah, there Ten? was a there was one year. There was one year age difference between them. He died in 1972 at 88 and she died in 1982 at 97. Wow. Uh, yeah, she was born in 1885. He was born in 1884. How well did you know your grandma Bess? A little, little better because I had her for another 10 years. And, you know, she came to stay with us in Washington and New York. Uh, and we went out there to see her. She, uh, she had a good sense of humor. But also, it's just that weird time. You know, it's, it's your grandmother and you sit down and talk to her. But, you know, you're also a 20-year-old. You know, where's the beer? You know, what's there to do in independence? <laughs> Nothing. At, at least at that time. Yeah, you're not thinking and you're, about it. Well, and you're kind of trapped in the house too. You know, you're you're under the Secret Service's roof. They kind of watch out for you. And so I wasn't encouraged to to go run off or, you know, go anywhere. Do I didn't know anybody or anything. So the times that we went to visit my grandmother, you're just kind of around her. And it wasn't for very long. We didn't stay, you know, weeks or anything like that, just a few days. Yeah, did I hear a story about I recall hearing a story about your grandmother, Bess Truman, and bourbon turkey. Uh, she was asked once, um, Grandpa liked straight bourbon. My grandmother drank uh, old fashions. And I imagine other kinds of drink, but she liked old fashioned. But somebody asked her once if it was true. They had heard that she poured bourbon down the throats of her turkey, her Thanksgiving turkey, to tenderize it. And my grandmother said, no, we pour the bourbon down the throats of our guests and they just think the turkey's tender. It's going to taste great. Going to taste fantastic. So, uh, but yes, yeah, she, she had, she all, both of them had a good sense of humor and both had, they didn't take themselves too seriously. The job, the work, their friends, their family, yes, but not themselves. So I want to ask you uh, if you can just Tell us a little bit more about your grandfather. Like, what was what were his early beginnings? And uh, I know he was a, a veteran of the First World War. Can you tell us about his early life before he became president? Born in Lamar, Missouri, tiny town Lamar, Missouri. Grew up in Independence, mostly. The family moved to town not long after that. Uh, and he grew up in independence. His father was a uh, livestock trader and farmer, a uh, family of farmers and traders. And his grandfather, his maternal grandfather, Solomon Young, outfitted wagon trains and led them west from Missouri. So these were all hardworking farm people, livestock people. And he grew up and went to uh, grade school and high school in independence with my grandmother. They were in the same class. They 
he first laid eyes on my grandmother in Sunday school when he was six and she was five. And as far as anybody can tell, he never looked at anybody else. He fell in love with her right then and there. And it wasn't, it wasn't reciprocated through school. They were friendly to each other, but there was no, there was no romance going on. Uh, that didn't start until later. But they, so he went to uh, grade school and high school in independence. He wanted to go to college or West Point or Annapolis, but his eyesight was too poor for the military. So he went, he went to work right out of high school. His, uh, they couldn't afford to send him to college. He went to work at, um, uh, they were building a spur of the Santa Fe Railroad near Independence. And he was the timekeeper. He was the paymaster. He kept track of everybody's hours and, and uh, paid them off every two weeks in the local saloon. Uh, he must have made quite a sight. I think David McCullough sort of expanded on that. He must have made quite a sight, this skinny, bespectacled 18-year-old and all these roughnecks with sledgehammers and picks and he got along fine he's i think that's that's where he he himself said it gave him some experience in the handling of men mm -hmm. so it gave him some early experience on how you manage people and, but i think it also it also seriously added to his foul language vocabulary he knew he knew a few beauties huh? he picked, yeah i'm sure he picked up quite a few uh on the gang on the railroad gang <laughs> so what about his military service he um he'd always wanted like i said he wanted west point or annapolis he'd always wanted a military career and couldn't have it so when he was he worked downtown in the early 19 in the early 19 aughts 1904-05-06 he worked for two different banks in downtown kansas city I think I can't remember if he was a banker. I think he, he joined the Missouri National Guard in 1906. And I don't know if that was while he was still in the bank or, or while he'd been called back to the family farm. His father needed grandpa and his uh, younger brother, John Vivian, to help work the farm, to help work the, the uh, young farm, Solomon Young's farm out of Grandview, Missouri, 26 miles from Independence. And the farm was, uh, the, the core of the farm was 600 acres. Oh, and they leased another few hundred. I think at one point they had a thousand or maybe even 2000 acres that they were farming. J.A. Truman and Sons uh, was the was the company. So at about the same time he went back to work the farm, he joined the Missouri National Guard and worked his way up through the ranks. He stayed in the guard, I think, until 1910 or 1911. And the farm was taking too much of his time and he couldn't he couldn't devote enough time to um, to the guard, so he he quit, but re-upped in uh, 1917 when we were mobilizing for World War One. He was made the lieutenant of his battery because even still in those days, if he raised the most recruits for a new battery, so they elected him lieutenant. Sort of shades of the old Civil War deal where officers could buy their commissions. You know, if you could put together a battery, and you know, so that's why you know the officers could could buy their captaincy their lieutenancy their majorship whatever so grandpa was elected lieutenant because he'd raised the most so the most applicants the most members and then they he trained at camp donathan at fort sill in lawton oklahoma and was sent over to france early in 1918 and trained to use the French guns. We, at the uh, Chateau de Montigny sur Aube, we've actually, uh, the Truman Libraries made a nice connection with the family that owns that chateau now. They, they have a Truman Grove at the chateau. So he trained there. Uh, they made him a captain and put him in charge of Battery D, which had, uh, in the play, it says he'd already been through two officers, but I think that battery had wiped out three or four officers. They were all educated, college and high school educated, most of them Irish Catholics, some Germans, but just a rowdy bunch, hard drinking. And, and if you, um, it's, like, it's like being around a lion or, or a dangerous wild animal and you show any sign of weakness, mm -hmm. you're finished. And a grandpa's success with them owed to the fact that the first thing he did was demote a lot of them after they got drunk the first night and stampeded some of the horses through the camp. No he kidding. said, that's it. You're, you know, you used to be a sergeant. You're buck private now and your pay's gone. And they straightened up after that. But he, he also, uh, 
he earned their respect because he led from the front. He was always, he wouldn't ask them to do anything he wouldn't do. And he cared about every single one of them. He got to know them. He got to know their families back home. He brought every one of them through the war in one piece. And they, um, they marched with him in his inauguration in 1948. And those that were still living came to his funeral in 1972. And even a couple who were still living came to my grandmother's funeral in 1982. Lifelong friends. That is so cool. I mean, I remember seeing photographs of your grandfather with the World War One helmet on, but with the big spectacles on. Well, that and that was the first story. I those were uh, what they call pince nez, the nose glasses, no earpieces, mm -hmm. and you had to wear those because you otherwise you couldn't get a gas mask on. You couldn't get a good seal around the gas mask. You couldn't have any leaks on the side where your your earpieces are. And Grandpa's eyes were bad enough that he always kept a spare pair or two. And the first story that I ever heard when I was a little about my grandfather serving in World War I was when he was riding his horse and a low branch caught him in the face and knocked his glasses off. Well, they were moving the guns, moving the unit, moving the battery. And so he didn't have time to, to stop. So he took the spare pair out of his tunic pocket and finished what he was doing. And uh, after everything was said and done, he turned around and looked behind him to see how the men were doing. And his first glasses, his first pair were sitting there on the rump of his horse. <laughs> that is a great story. I love it. I and love it's it. It's actually in his memoirs. Or I've read that. I've, I've read that from his own hand, too. So he comes back. Well, he wasn't wounded at all, was he? No, no. He, he came close. He wrote to my grandmother. He put everything in those letters. You think, you know, you should hold some stuff back, Grandpa. Like. Like the fact that you got up one morning, rolled up your sleeping bag, threw it over your shoulder, walked 40 or 50 feet away, and a shell lands right where you were sleeping. You know, and then he writes that to my grandmother. I'm like, you know, yeah. don't tell her that until you get home. That wasn't helpful. No, not helpful at all. So, you know, he, he came close and it was hard, but uh, he himself, I think, said that, of course, the real uh, heroes and in any war and that war with the folks that are in the front lines and the trenches. He was back with the guns. Yeah. We're thankful that he did make it through the war and he came home mm -hmm. and uh, he, he went into the haberdashery business, didn't he? he did. How'd that come about? He did. He and his uh, Eddie Jacobson, grandpa and Eddie uh, had known each other since grandpa was a bank clerk and Eddie was the, uh, uh, the clerk for a dry goods store brought the receipts in at the end of the day every day and grandpa was the vault clerk so he always took the receipt and they just saw something in each other uh, when they met eddie was 15 and grandpa was 22 so there's quite a bit of age difference but they they had lunch together every once in a while just struck up a friendship and then they ran into each other at basic training at camp donovan and the two of them together ran the only successful canteen each unit had its own general store canteen not like today when you have an enormous base px or two or three uh, but each unit had its own canteen and almost well every other one of them according to uh, legend lore history every other one failed due to thievery bad management whatever except for grandpa's and eddie's and they they uh, they collected uh, i think a dollar each from all the men to buy the initial buy the initial stores the initial inventory and wound up paying everybody back and then some. I mean, the, the, the men were their investors and they wound up paying back their investors repeatedly. Grandpa joked at one point, he said, we're, we're learning, like we're earning at about 620%, like standard oil. Uh, yes, they, definitely. So they did very well and they naturally thought that that would translate well when they got back. And they made this uh, deal. They were both on the same troop ship. And I think the latest I heard was... Uh, they they were both seasick. They were both really ill, but you know, probably standing there at the railing, waiting to throw up again. They they hatched this plan on the handshake. They uh, they decided on their way home, and they uh, they opened Truman and Jacobson in downtown Kansas City, across the street from where the Mulebach Hotel still stands today. I want to say it's like 11th or 12th Street, but they um, anyway the store and they did very well the first year. They earned the equivalent of about three quarters of a million bucks that first year, 1919, 1920. But the post-war recession tanked them. Their inventory was nearly worthless. Neither one of them wanted to declare bankruptcy. They, they, wanted, they wanted to pay all their bills. They wanted to pay back all their creditors. Eddie couldn't stick after, I think, two years. He had to declare bankruptcy. He just didn't have the, he didn't have the income to be able to do it. 
Grandpa was a bit luckier. He was by that time a, a judge, a county judge of Jackson County. So he had a salary. It took him 10 years, but he paid back every one of their creditors. I'm thinking now, so your grandfather had not gone to college. Nope. He went away. He served his country. He came back. He was a, a haberdasher. He was a, obviously a, a pretty good businessman. But then you mentioned that he was a judge. So how did that happen? That was, uh, they call him a judge. There were three judges. These are not judicial. They're county commissioners, elected officials. And there were three in Jackson County, Missouri. There was a presiding judge. And then there was an Eastern judge and a Western judge covering the whole area. Grandpa ran for Eastern judge in 1922 uh, with the help of Jim Pendergast, who was an army buddy. Jim's uncle, Tom Pendergast, ran the Democratic machine in Jackson County. And Jim had thought that grandpa would make a, a good candidate for judge. And grandpa had political ambitions. He had even, it's weird because you read one of his letters from France during the war. He mentions to her, you know, come back and have a little politics, maybe even run for Eastern judge of Jackson County. There it was. So uh, Jim convinced his uncle that grandpa would make a good candidate for public office. The joke being, and I think Jim actually told this to his uncle, he said that uh, Harry Truman's an officer in the war whose men hadn't wanted to shoot him. <laughs> so he, he was, you know, he had a good reputation. He was, you know, he had a lot going for him. And they, he ran in 22 and won to two-year term. And he ran in 24 and lost, mainly because the Ku Klux Klan was against him in that election because he refused to join and he refused to, to reserve all the jobs for white people. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, uh, he ran 24 and he lost, but also because the, the two factions of the Democratic Party in Missouri had split, the, the, the St. Louis faction and the Kansas City faction that were at odds over, over plum jobs. And they lined up against not just grandpa, but they lined up against the Pendergast. And, they, and so he lost in 24 and spent two years I think they ran a savings and loan. He, ran, he sold memberships to the Automobile Club of Greater Kansas City, I think it was. Took some law classes at what is now the University of Missouri at Kansas City School of Law. Uh, and then ran again in, in uh, 1926 for presiding judge and won that election. And that's a four-year term. And he won again in 1930, another four-year term. And then in 1934, he, he ran and won a seat in the United States Senate. So 1934... He is a United States Senator from Missouri. And in 10 years, he was to become Vice President of the United States. So how did that happen? I mean, it, it's only 10 years, really. I mean, 10 years is not a long time. He's, you know, again, he, he was a judge. Uh, he was, a, so he was a freshman Senator in 1934. And then uh, vice president during a very critical time in the United States history. World yeah. War II was going on. Franklin Roosevelt was president, but he was not a, a robust, healthy man at that point. How did he ascend or get the nod to become the vice presidential candidate in the election of 1944? Well, that was always, the, uh, that's, you know, that's backroom politics. Uh, trying to get, trying to put a, together a ticket that'll win. The Democratic Party was fractured at that point. I think primarily between North and South, you had the Democrats and you had the Dixiecrats. So you had a, a fractious Democratic Party. Henry Wallace had been Roosevelt's vice president. And the feeling was that Mr. Wallace was just a bit too liberal to run again. Liberal mostly, I think they were afraid toward the Soviets. He was, he was sort of soft on the whole idea. Uh, very liberal, a brilliant man, and apparently a, a, just a cool guy, but just not what the party uh, muckety-mucks wanted. You know, if, if, and thinking ahead, you know, the president was not in good health and thinking, you know, if we have to deal with, and, and that shows you something about history, you know, they're already in 1944 thinking about what it's gonna be like to deal with the Soviets after the war. I Anyway, they, they wanted somebody to replace Henry Wallace. And a couple of guys, including, I think it was William O. Douglas, had asked Grandpa to put him up 
you know, to mention him, uh, back him for vice president. And grandpa had agreed to do that. I think it was Douglas or it was Jimmy Burns. I should know these things. Anyway, uh, but he'd been asked by a couple of different people. And I think those were the two to, to put him up, put them up for vice president. And he had agreed to the one who asked him first. I think it was, it was Burns. But behind the scenes, people are lobbying to get him in there. He was a choice candidate because he was palatable to both the North and the South. He was from a border state from the Civil War, Missouri. He had been grown up in a Confederate leaning household, mm -hmm. although the, they'd sworn an oath to the Union that it was Confederate leaning household, divided as Missouri was in those days. So he was palatable to both the North and the South. Plus, he had a good reputation as a senator, not only among his colleagues. But he was nationally known because he had been in, he'd been investigating waste and fraud in the military buildup leading up to the United States entry in the war. You know, the what we all used to joke about in the 70s and 80s, you know, the $10,000 toilet seats and stuff like that, the way the cost overruns, uh, machinery that didn't work, planes that didn't fly. Uh, there was one platform, and I won't say, well, I can't say what company was making it, but the wings were too short and it crashed a lot. Mm -hmm. Things like that. And so he had been saving this country, uh, not just billions of dollars, but lives uh, to equipment that otherwise would have, would have killed them. So he had a national reputation. It was a bipartisan committee. They were, not, they were not grandstanding. They were not making, they were not even doing a lot of publicity. But word got out that he was doing the right thing. So he had a good reputation. So he was, he was very palatable to the party. He, he satisfied, it was all about party unity. It's all about holding it together. So that's why he became the candidate, but it was the last thing he wanted. He, his joke was, of course, you know, the, the old story that a woman had two sons. One became a sea captain and one became vice president of the United States. Neither one of them was ever heard from again. Ah, definitely. So what did your grandmother think about your grandfather becoming a vice presidential candidate? Was that a good thing for her? Or was she upset about it? Um, not, I, not happy. I mean, they both understood duty, but that's hard because I'm sure that the grandpa was, was a bit more hopeful. I think that he looked at FDR and just everybody did. Everybody around FDR had their fingers crossed. FDR himself was talking about retirement in four years you know, after the war was over. Uh, so everybody hoped, could not imagine, could not imagine the country without him. He'd been the president for 12 years. So I think grandpa was more hopeful. My grandmother seems to have been a bit more realistic about that. She, you know, she could see how sick the president was, but she did what, what she had to do. He was nominated to be vice president. And so she went along, but, but you know, they, they did the job president and first lady, and they did it well but their happiest years had been the 10 years in the Senate. And it was a collegial atmosphere <laughs> back in those days. There was, uh, you know, it was, it was solving problems. It was working together. It was trying to figure things out. President's a lonely job. Like grandpa said, buck stops here, you're it. Yes, that's one of his most famous sayings. Yeah, so I, you know, she was, uh, I'm sure she was disappointed like, oh, God, here we go. But, but at the same time, she would have been, all right, let's, we're going to do this to the best of our ability. And they did. Yeah, they did. Now, April, I think it was April 12th, if, if, my, if I remember yep. correctly, Franklin Roosevelt dies in office. I think he was down in uh, Warm Springs, Georgia. And your grandfather gets that call. Yeah, he got called over. He was, I think he was in Sam Rayburn's office from Texas. And he got a call from Steve Early, uh, the president's secretary, I think Mr. Early was. And uh, he said, would you please come over to the White House right away? And so grandpa did, just went over there. They didn't tell him what had happened. And he assumed that the president had returned from Warm Springs and wanted to brief him on something. So he went back over there and he walked in, walked into the White House. And the first person who greeted him was Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said, Harry, the president is dead. And the first thing that grandpa said was, what can we do for you? And Mrs. Roosevelt said, I think the question is, what can we do for you? You're the one who's in trouble now. Mm. Uh, but he said afterwards, when he got the news, he, he said that it felt like the sun, the moons, and all the planets had fallen on him. It was, he was stunned. 
I can only imagine what he must have felt because at this point, Germany had not yet surrendered. They were less than, I think, a month away from surrendering. Yeah. So the war in, in Europe was still going on. You had the threat of the Soviet Union and what they were going to do next. Then you also had the war with Japan and the atomic bomb decision. And just t- take us through that a little bit, uh, Clifton. Is it true that your grandfather did not know anything about the atomic bomb project while Roosevelt was still living? Yeah, that is true. Not a lot of people knew about it. I've been to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They have a, a good museum out there and, they, and people still live in many of the houses that they built for the scientists and workers in 1942. That place was so secret that the, the people who worked the machines didn't know what they were doing. They were told, I think one, uh, one woman reported that she was told that they were ice cream makers, you know, keeping, making sure that the temperature stayed in the right place. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. And they had, of course, these scientists had families, had children. They had a high school, had a great school and a high school. And the uh, high schoolers never played a home game. And when they played an away game, their names were not on their jerseys and they were not allowed to interact with the other team. They played and they left. No names, no nothing. So they kept that top secret. Grandpa stumbled on it by accident after the Manhattan Project started in 1942 or maybe early 1943. He was getting reports that millions and millions of dollars were disappearing into the middle of Tennessee uh, in Black Oak Ridge, as it was called then, and in Hanford, Washington. Just, and the money seemed to, be going, seemed to be just disappearing. So that was a red flag for the Truman Committee investigating waste and fraud. So he sent inspectors out there. And Secretary of War Henry Stimson came to his office and asked him, please recall those men. That is a legitimate expense and it's top secret. And Grandpa did. They were in the middle of a war and he had great respect for Stimson. And he turned, he got a hold of those guys and brought them back. So I'm I'm assuming the light bulb must have gone off when Stimson came to him right after he took the oath of office and said, we have a very, very powerful new weapon that you need to know about. Um, and it's still in development. We're getting ready to test it. And Grandpa may well have thought, mm, that's what you guys were doing. He probably knew for certain a week, uh, almost two weeks later, when Stimson came to brief him fully and brought General Leslie Groves, the manager, the chief cook and bottle washer for the Manhattan Project. They snuck General Groves in through a side door so that nobody would see him come to meet the president. Again, secrecy. And General Groves and Secretary Stimson gave Grandpa a full briefing on the weapon. But he did not know about it, fully about it until then. So from not knowing anything about it to being responsible for making the decision to use that weapon must have been, it's a big leap, isn't it? Well, yeah. And he had to, uh, he had help. They immediately, they formed the interim committee, which was made up of the presidents of Harvard and MIT and Vannevar Bush, who was, I, I can't remember the exact name of the office, but Office of the American, you know, the U.S. Office of Scientific Development in charge of that. And they had, um, they had the help from some of the scientists on the project, I, I believe, including Dr. Oppenheimer. And the point of the interim committee was, was basically twofold, to decide whether or not the weapon should be used and having made that decision if to be used, where and how do you use it? And they went through various scenarios and what they all came up with at the end, the committee's recommendation was to use the weapon and to use it unexpectedly on a Japanese target. They felt that there was some discussion of using it on a deserted island out in the middle of the Pacific as a, as a demonstration for the Japanese. But there was the feeling that the Japanese were the, the military anyway, and I'm not, I don't mean the people in Japan who were caught up in the middle of this, but the military was so determined to resist to the last that a, a, a demonstration it was felt would not convince them. And it would have to, it would have to be real consequences. So that's where the decision was made. They picked, they picked four cities. They picked Hiroshima. The second one was supposed to be Kokura. The third was Nagasaki. And I think the fourth was Niigata. But they picked those four cities. 
And of course, they ended up deciding to bomb two of the four cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Tens of thousands of civilians died in those cities uh, compared to a much smaller number of military people. But each city had a military component. Hiroshima, for example, was the headquarters of uh, two armies and one regional police force, as well as a port where they were uh, soldiers uh, embarked for China and other points from Hiroshima. Nagasaki was a shipbuilding center. You had the Mitsubishi shipworks at Nagasaki. So there was a military element to each of those cities. So there must have been many components involved in making that decision that your grandfather had to make. But one of the things I've always read about is that had we not dropped those bombs that the Japanese military and most likely many of the civilians would have been brought into it as well to defend their island. And it could have cost, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not up to a million allied losses, casualties, invading Japan as opposed to using the weapons. So that was another consideration in the decision. That was, yeah. His first, uh, his, his priority, he always said, was to, was to stop the war and save American and Japanese lives mm-hmm. in that order. And there were, the numbers are all over the place, but generally uh, they expected, there's one number that that's sort of a solid number in advance. They were still planning, even when, when they were talking about using the bomb, they were still planning the invasion of Japan which was supposed to start that fall. And they minted half a million Purple Hearts in expectation of casualties, American casualties alone. And I believe this country is still using those Purple Hearts. They have not run out of that original half million in all the wars since, just to give you an idea of the number. The... The other thing to consider, and I, my family and I have been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki twice, collected, we we interviewed survivors and collected those interviews for the Truman Library, and they are used as part of the new atomic bomb exhibit Mm. in the Truman Library so that you have, you have both sides. As I told my, my children years ago, it's important they understand their great grandfathers and their country's position and decision, but also to understand the Japanese side to understand what that cost, particularly what that cost the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and what it could cost any of us if we let it happen again. So, but that still using those uh, Purple Hearts and, and talking to survivors, uh, they even the ones who who uh, say that the decision was wrong, we didn't, Japan was beaten, it was unnecessary, it was cruel. Even those will tell you that they were being trained with bamboo poles being trained to fight, children, school children, older school children being trained to fight, Uh, housewives, grab any utensil you can. They were attached to regular military units. So civilians were gonna fight alongside and they, the government was telling them that it was better to to fall like the cherry blossoms. uh, Everyone in Japan should fall like the cherry blossoms and die a beautiful death rather than suffer the uh, ignominy of defeat. So it was, it was going to be, by all accounts, it was going to be a, a bloodbath in Japan. Uh, again, that does, not, that does not in any way negate the horror that those weapons wreaked upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Definitely. And I can only just imagine what your grandfather had to go through to make that. The fact that that decision had to be made is a tremendous responsibility for him to have assumed, and he, he had to make a decision, and he made one. He did. He said, he, he said afterwards, he, he was never, uh, he was asked, oh, you know, several times, you know, did it bother him? Yeah, it did. He was asked on the beach at, on Wake Island. The story goes that uh, Joe O'Donnell, a photographer who had taken some of the initial photos in Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the war, O'Donnell was shaken badly by what he had seen, and he was a uh, alone with grandpa on the beach at Wake Island. And he asked him, did he ever have any regrets? And grandpa said, yes, hell yes, you can't, you don't, you don't want to have to do that kind of thing. And he even stopped, there was a, I think it was Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, wrote him, sent him a telegram telling him, you know, 
use as many of those bombs as you have. And if you don't have enough of those left, use standard weapons, use conventional bombs, blow the Japanese, just, just destroy the island, hit them with everything. And grandpa wrote him back and said, no, you don't, I don't want to do that. I regret having to do this and I'm not going to do any more of it than I absolutely need to. He took, after the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, um, to grandpa, that seemed a little quick. That was only three days later that they dropped the second bomb after Hiroshima. And at that point, grandpa took control of nuclear weapons back from the military to whom he'd given it initially. And it, it rests with the president to this day, civilian control of nuclear weapons. Grandpa's joke was, I don't want some dashing lieutenant colonel to be the one to figure out when to use one. Yeah, definitely. So this is all within four months of taking office. This all happens. And, you know, we could we could go on forever about your grandfather's presidency. There were so many different important aspects of it, and I don't want to minimize any of them. He certainly had to get involved with carving up Europe. Uh, with Stalin and Churchill and the Marshall Plan and all the different things in those areas. And then, of course, you know, trying to uh, stem the, the spread of communism. And then, of course, you had the Korean War and your grandfather had to fire General MacArthur. There's so many different things that happened. But I wanted to just focus in on a, on a couple other lighter notes, shall we say, about Harry Truman's presidency. And one of them is, and we're going to get a lot lighter here, but it was very important. Tell us about what happened to the physical White House while your grandfather was president. Well, in three words, it fell apart. It, uh, I, I did a, I do, I give a speech on the, the restoration of the White House. It, he, <laughs> they, they kicked him and my grandmother and my mother out in early 1949 after he had won, or late 1948 after he'd won the election, um, they moved over to Blair House and lived there for almost three and a half years while they rebuilt the White House on the inside out. They took it down to the, uh, to the stone and rebuilt it on a steel interior structure. And I asked the White House Historical Society for this speech that I put together a few years ago. I, I said, this is great. You know, I'm sure that what I want to do is, is write a speech that blames every president before my grandfather for the condition of the White House. I want to know who drilled into the walls, who thought that air conditioning was important, electric lights, who, who knocked out things, who, who, what kind of mistakes did they all make? And they said, well, that would be hilarious if it were true, but it isn't. You can only blame two presidents. You can blame Teddy Roosevelt and Calvin Coolidge, but before you blame either one of them, you have to blame the British for burning it to the, you know, burning the interior, gutting it in 1814 during the War of 1812. Fire burned really hot, and then a storm, a, a squall, a rainstorm, doused it very quickly, and it cooled quickly, and all the brick crumbled, the, the, all the wood was gone, the brick crumbled, the stone cracked. But because it's the symbol of this nation, they built it back quickly. What had taken them originally eight years, they did in three years. So there was less brick. Some of it was inferior. And the White House wasn't quite the, uh, the bulwark that it had been. And then along comes Teddy Roosevelt and wants to enlarge the state dining room. So he knocks out a load-bearing wall oh. and suspends the floor above it from the roof. So he's now got a, he's basically got a hammock. The second floor is now on a hammock, just sort of, you know, swinging from, from the roof. He also <laughs> took out, he also took out the West staircase. There were two grand staircases and he took out that one and that wall. And so now it's now, now the second floor is hanging from the roof. And then the Calvin Coolidge comes along a couple of decades later and redoes the roof and redoes the third floor using concrete. So now you have concrete squashing something that's holding up the floor like a hammock. It started to crack almost immediately. And by the time my uh, grandparents and my mother moved in, you could see the cracks in the walls. In the upstairs study, when a butler brought my grandfather his lunch one day, both of them felt the floor shifting under them, swaying. When grandpa was in the East Room for a ceremony, he noticed that the chandelier was wiggling as the, as the uh, color guard marched under it. And finally, the leg of my mother's piano in her sitting room punched through the floor of her sitting room into the family dining room below and dropped the ceiling a foot and a half, broke a beam and dropped the ceiling. And that was it. They got him out of there. 
gutted it and rebuilt it. Oh my gosh. When they rebuilt it, they, they gutted the interior part. Yeah. yeah. They left the walls. Grandpa insisted. He wouldn't even let them. They wanted to, to knock off some of the stones so they could drive trucks inside to do some of the bulldozing work and, and, you know, carry out debris. And grandpa would not let them. He made them uh, take the trucks apart outside and rebuild them inside. They were not allowed to touch the symbol of this country, not, not touch the stone. That's tremendous. Did I hear also that they, while they were rebuilding and gutting, that they actually found some of the scorched timbers from when yeah. the house was set fire? Yeah, I think so. They found scorched timbers. They found old stonemason's marks, yeah. found all sorts of cool historic stuff on the inside. That is definitely interesting. So when did the, the Trumans move back into the White yeah. House? March of 1952. Of course, oh. he was out of office less than a year later. <laughs> so all that fun. work, all that work on that whistle stop campaign, winning the presidency. And I'm sorry, you have to move out of the house and go live at the small place across the street. The Blair House. Which was lovely. Blair House is gorgeous. Blair and Lee houses, they're, they're together, two houses together. They're really, you know, if you can't live in the White House, oh, Blair House is not a bad, not a bad backup. It's beautiful. <laughs> Now, you mentioned about your mother's piano. Your mother used to sing. She did. She did. She was. She started training, I think, to sing when she was 12 or 13 years old, maybe a little younger. Always wanted a singing career and had one. She took some flack for it. Of course, being the president's daughter, there's that famous Paul Hume of the Washington Post wrote a less than kind review of my mother's concert. And grandpa was in a foul mood that day he was he was already i think already embroiled in korea and his and his oldest friend uh, charlie ross his press secretary had died at his desk that morning of a heart attack so grandpa read mr hume's review and dashed off a letter calling mr hume a few names and telling him at the end that if he ever ran into him he was going to need a new nose uh, stakes for black eyes and perhaps a supporter below <laughs> <laughs> Give him hell Harry, right? Yeah. Well, the mail, when it came out, when Hume apparently wasn't going to publish it, but a colleague at another paper mm. got wind of it. So they had to go ahead with it. But the mail, I think, ran 80 to 20 percent in favor of grandpa defending my mother. Yes, I've only heard positive things about defending his daughter. And uh, that is somewhat famous story. And now I recall you telling me that was Mr. Hume was also a, did he do some he singing? He was also a singer. Yeah, I gave a speech uh, up into a retirement home up in Evanston, Illinois. God, this must have been 20 years ago. And during the Q&A period, a lady put her hand up and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you know, I knew Paul Hume. And I said, really? And she said, yes, I used to accompany him. And I said, and I, I didn't get it at first. I accompany him where, you know, what kind of trips? And she said, no, 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 no. I played piano. And I said, he sang? And she said, yes. And I said, well, on behalf of my mother, I have to ask, how was he? And this lady said, like a cow mooing, <laughs> which was a little unfair. Mr. Hume was actually a pretty good singer, but I, I called my mother when I got home that night and I told her that story and the line went dead. And I thought, what, have I, what did I do? Well, it turned out she dropped the phone. She was laughing so hard. Ah, uh, yes. Revenge. Revenge, finally. <laughs> oh, wow. I just have to back up a little bit because you had mentioned about your grandfather not being told about the atomic bomb, the plans for the atomic bomb. As I recall, Franklin Roosevelt didn't really have that much interaction with your grandfather, his vice president, before his death. Is that true? That's true. I think they only met twice, and uh, both of them were more photo op than uh, informative. President Roosevelt did that. That was his leadership style. He kept his cards close to his vest. He didn't, uh, he didn't share a lot. Uh, he liked to be the one holding the strings and doling out information as needed. Yeah. Uh, but a few years ago, I was on a, a trip, a, a commemoration of the end of the war with David Roosevelt, FDR's grandson, and Mary Jean Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's granddaughter. And Mary Jean and David and I were talking about, and we we actually did put together a program that the three of us gave a few times on the relationships between our grandfathers, you know, because they had interesting, it, you know, friendship turned not to friendship and all of that between Ike and my grandfather. And of course, Ike had a relationship with Roosevelt and, and my grandfather did. Anyway, at the end of the night, we were joking around and I said to David Roosevelt, I said, you know, your grandfather didn't tell my grandfather a damn thing. 
and everybody went up to bed. And the next morning we all came down to breakfast and I asked David, how are you, David? He said, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he got you there, huh? He did. He did. That was a good one. And it's made a good story ever since. Thank you, David. Wow. So your grandfather went into retirement. You told us a lot about that from what you, some of your remembrances of your grandfather. He's led kind of a simple life, simplish yeah. life uh, in retirement. Uh, he was sort of interviewed for a few key things that happened, but generally speaking, he was in retirement. Now, I want to ask you, how has your life been impacted by being the grandson, the oldest grandson of President Harry Truman? Um, you know, it's a funny question because I don't know anything different. I don't know what I would have been had I just been, you know, had I not been a president's grandchild. So it's always been there. As a kid, of course, you know, growing up on Park Avenue, uh, you know, my classmates were the children of bankers and lawyers and doctors and politicians. I mean, you know, I was just another fish in the pond. We were brought up not to make a big deal out of it. Anyway, I mean, when I went to school with Walter Cronkite's son, oh. you know, who's paying attention to me. So it was downplayed a bit. It was, like I said earlier, it was fun traveling with them. It was fun visiting with them. The House of Independence is beautiful. Lots of stuff to play with. So it was, you know, it was a pretty good childhood. And then I went through the, the phase, which I think a lot of a lot of us do, a lot of us presidential descendants, like, okay, well, what do I do? You know, everybody talks about grandpa and the great president. Okay, who, who am I? What do I do with this? So I went off and, and uh, you know, made a few dozen mistakes at first and then landed up, you know, with a career as a journalist and in public relations, got married, had children. And just live my life and then it wasn't until i was in my 30s that i sort of rediscovered my grandparents as people mm -hmm. and began to take part with the truman library and uh yeah because i'm not, i'm not going to be president of the united states or i don't politics is not for me but one of the best things about my grandfather and my grandmothers they were they were really good decent human beings i always tried to do the right thing they had a sense of humor they didn't take themselves seriously i just really liked them i liked them as grandparents when i was little and i liked the uh the adults they were before I knew them. So that started me just thinking about my grand, writing about them occasionally. And then in, after taking early retirement about nine years ago, just giving lectures on him and, and her and on, um, on the presidency in the White House. And then this latest thing, playing my own grandfather on stage and give him Hell Harry, the one man show. So it, you know, it sort of swung from you know, completely not doing anything with the family legacy to like jumped in with both feet, you know, playing your own grandfather on stage, which is fun, but it's, it's just weird. I, you, you could not have convinced me if you had told me 30 or 40 years ago, yeah, you're going to play him on stage when you're an old man. <laughs> no, you are out of your mind. And here and you so, are. You know, so, you know, going from uh, a grandchild to uh doing my own thing to jumping back in with both feet. It's interesting. So you're actively giving these performances now. Yeah. yeah, we just finished one. We just finished two in Springfield, Illinois, Wilmington, North Carolina, the weekend before that, Cape May, New Jersey coming up, Wisconsin, Long Island, Rolla, Missouri. So it's, um, as you can imagine, everything stopped cold during the pandemic. We couldn't have live theater, but it's fun. Polly and I go, she does. <laughs> I'm just the talent. Polly does the costumes the makeup, the hair, the props, all of that stuff. So I, I carry my own uh, management company with me in the form of my lovely wife. So you're a team. Yeah, and it's fun. We, if we're lucky, we, um, we get to build in an extra day or so at each place, especially if it's somewhere we've never been before and just you know go see the sites. Yeah, and see things. Like my wife, Kelly, and I, we, we're a team on this podcast and we're, we work pretty well together. We don't fight that much. There was, a, there was just as a quick aside, there was a when we were in Hiroshima, we went to a sushi bar, sushi restaurant, but tiny place, about eight seats at the bar and then another four in a window table. And the couple who were the sushi chef and the woman who was working with him were a fantastic team. They, you know, they just weaved in and out seamlessly. She was clearing off plates and refilling sake glasses and he was making sushi and keeping up a banter with everybody. 
And finally, our uh, our guide, Kazuko Minamoto, was so curious. She's like, I wonder, are they married? And we we got a couple of sakis and it said, go ahead and ask, find out what the relationship is. And so she asked him, you know, what are you married? And the husband grinned real big and said, no, divorced. Oh, no kidding me. They were divorced, but they had a good business and they worked well together. So they kept at it. I, I don't know if, they, if they'd each remarried, but... He just he was tickled pink to tell us that he had a, this, we, and, and his wife was his ex-wife was smiling as well. They're just like, yep, works. It worked. Oh wow. <laughs> so when you went to Japan to visit, I understand it was very impactful to you because there's a story about your son and uh, is it Sadako? A person by the name of Sadako. Sadako. Sorry. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, I had never, you know, I learned about the atomic bombings in school, like you and everybody else. The only difference between us is that I could go home and fact check, you know, with my mother and, and ask questions. And I, our, our textbooks don't tell you much. It's, you know, covering all of U.S. history. You get a page or two pages of the atomic bombing, the end of the war, a picture of the mushroom cloud. But you don't really, I never really knew what had happened to the people uh, on the ground, the Japanese. When West was 10... Uh, he brought home a book, Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. And it's, it's, uh, it's a slightly fictionalized true story. Sadako Sasaki was two years old when the bomb destroyed Hiroshima. She and her family escaped virtually unharmed, luckily, but Sadako developed radiation-induced leukemia nine years later. Oh. To help in her own treatment, she followed a Japanese tradition that says if you fold uh, a thousand origami paper cranes, uh, you are granted its health, long life. The crane is a symbol of life and health in Japan. Uh, Sadako folded 1,300 cranes, but sadly died of the leukemia at the age of 12 in 1955. Mm -hmm. There's a monument to her and to all the children who were killed and wounded and sickened by the bomb in the Hiroshima Peace Park. That was the first personal story I had ever seen of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Wesley's teacher, Rosemary Barilla, didn't just give them the book. She taught them Japanese history, taught them Japanese culture. They had a tea ceremony in class. So she took them to a Japanese restaurant. They folded cranes. I came home one afternoon. I found Wesley in the living room wearing a kimono with green tea and sushi laid out on the coffee table. No Back kidding me. Being table. immersed in the culture. We had Japanese dinner sitting on the floor. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I mentioned this to a couple of Japanese writers, journalists, and of course it was read in Japan. And I had a call from Masahiro Sasaki, Sadako's older brother, also a survivor, who just said, you know, I, uh, you read my sister's story with your family. Can we meet someday? Can we do something? I said, sure. It took us five years and we met at the 9-11 the Memorial in New York City, near where they were at that time, they were building the memorial to the World Trade Center and the 9-11 Tribute Center. And Yuji and Masahiro Sasaki and his son, Yuji, were donating one of Sadako's last original cranes to the memorial as a gesture of healing. And at the end of, uh, near the end of our conversation with them, Yuji uh, carries a small plastic box and with some cranes in it. And he took out one of the cranes and he dropped it into my palm and said, that's the last one Sadako folded before she died. And at that point, he and his father asked me if I would consider going to Japan for the memorial ceremonies. We did two years later, Polly and Wesley and his brother Gates and I went to both ceremonies. And in between, we met with more than two dozen survivors just to let us tell them their stories. And each one of them said the same thing afterward. They weren't angry. They didn't come wanting an apology or any recrimination, all they said was, please, please keep telling these stories so that we don't do this again. Right. But that's how, that's how we got there. Very, very impactful for you and, and your, your wife and your son, I'm sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, if you had an opportunity to have coffee with your grandfather today for an hour, you know, just in a casual cafe somewhere, what would you want to ask him now? Um, I, you know, I, you and I talked a bit about this the other day. Uh, I, I think, uh, and I can't remember what I said then, so good, you're going to get something completely new. The, <laughs> I think I would just, it, it would be all over the place. I'd want to ask uh, about his early life. I'd want to know what it was like 
uh, working a farm, being a judge after that, fighting in World War I, uh, meeting my grandmother, working for the Pendergast organization. You know, what was that really like? And then what must it have been like to have that, uh, to have the presidency dropped on you? And what were you thinking? Uh, why did you do what you did? I mean, he's, he's written all this. We know his reasons, but I think it just, you know, and I would hope that it would be uh, uh, over a, a cup of coffee, it would be a fun conversation. We had, Polly and I had a wonderful conversation yesterday morning leaving Springfield, Springfield with uh, Paul and Sally Page. Paul Page is, did the uh, announcements for the Indy 500. Uh, he may still, oh. but uh, yeah, Paul's been in the business a long time and they're a great couple. And we, we just, we, you know, breakfast was meant to be an hour. We were there for three hours just talking about it because it was fun. And I would, I would hope that we get grandpa started on something like that because um, I would want his, his sense of humor uh, and his perspective on a lot of that stuff that you just, you can't get as easily from the pages of a book or a televised interview. Yeah. If only we had that opportunity to do that. Yeah. What a gift that would be, but there is a lot written about your grandfather and, and you do have surviving documents that he wrote, but I also understand that your grandmother burned a lot of letters. <laughs> yeah, she did. We, <laughs> They wrote constantly. They wrote. They wrote like twice a day when they were apart. You know, the morning because they had morning and afternoon mail in those days, and um, they wrote hundreds of letters to each other during their courtship and after between uh, 1910 and about 1955 when they were good and well retired. So 45 years of letters. The Truman Library owns 1,362 letters that my grandfather wrote to my grandmother. We only have 184 of hers back. And that's because grandpa came home one day in 1955, around Christmas time. And he found my grandmother in front of a roaring fire, burning all of the letters she'd ever written to him. Oh, he, he stopped her and he said, you know, what, <laughs> what are you doing? What do you don't? She said, it, you know, it's my business. It's, uh, you've read them, they're my, they're my life. She said, but good Lord, think of history. And she smiled and said, oh, I have. Oh. I didn't that. You know, she didn't want her private correspondence out there. He didn't mind his. But she, um, you know, she just didn't think that was anybody's business but her own. The 184 letters that survived, I put them into a book a few years ago with a lot, matched them with grandpa's in the 1920s and 30s. And it's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some stuff that, uh, you know, she has some opinions, not always good of people which you do in a letter. So I think she just, she just figured that was nobody's business but her own. She's right. I mean, it's too bad we don't have them. I'd love to read them. Yeah. But they are, uh, they are Ash and Adams now. Definitely. So I'm going to ask you now, let's, let's talk about you. Clifton, you're busy doing performances and portraying your grandfather. Do you think you've captured his essence in your acting? <laughs> I hope so, at least some of it. Um, but, you know, I, I worry less and less about it. I, you know, I worked on you too. You're talking about finding interviews of grandpa online earlier. And, and, you know, I went around, I trolled around, got videos and, and sound recordings of him speaking so that I could pick up that, that uh, unique sort of, well, as he would call it, his Missouri accent. It's, uh, it's a little Southern and it's a little Midwestern. Um, so pick up his accent and watch videos to get some of his hand mannerisms. Although you always, you always get a different thing between when he's doing public speaking, when he's just sitting around talking to people. So I, you know, I tried to do that as accurately as possible, but also to have fun with it. Again, like I said, he had a sense of humor and the play is very well written. There's lots of information and lots of fun parts in it. So, um, you know, I, I just try to try to relax and Try to relax and let the DNA do some of the work. We're speaking on Zoom right now. I can see you. Our, our listeners cannot, but you do resemble your grandfather. And I've seen pictures of you in character with your costume and everything. And you really look a lot like him <laughs> for the show. So how can people find out about how to get tickets, how to go see you? Um, but I should update my website, Google Clifton Truman Daniel. And there's a website with the dates on it. I need to update it in the next couple of days. 
I think it's, I think we've got through Cape May on there, but I need to put the rest of it on. Um, so they can find it that way. And I also have an agent in New York who schedules Gardner Arts Network, Jeanette Gardner. I like the last name. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, uh, spelled exactly the same. You're probably cousins. We could be, I haven't found them yet. <laughs> sure we'll find each other at some point. So last question. Yeah. Clifton, what do you want your legacy to be? I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think just my grandfather's favorite headstone, and I'm sure he got this question too, but it's a bigger deal coming from an ex-president. Uh, his favorite headstone, he thought the most appropriate headstone in the country was uh, in Tombstone, Arizona on Boot Hill. Uh, it simply says, here lies Jack Williams. He done his damnedest. So I think that's a pretty good legacy to have if you just do your best. And a lot of it's in the, I don't know about the big picture, but a lot of it's in the small things, treating people decently, trying to do your best with whatever you're doing, you're, you know, a speech or a performance play. You know, we have a friend down in Wilmington listening to the news and listening to all the opinions. We're all at each other's throats. And her attitude is just, you know what? I have, <laughs> I have my own problems. <laughs> <laughs> I have my own life to lead. I don't need to worry about the politics and, and all the craziness, you know, just try to get along with people as best you can. Doesn't matter what, who they voted for or what they think, just try to be a decent human being. I'm with you on that one, Clifton. And I really have been a, a student of American presidents for many years, even as a little kid. And I always admired your grandfather very much from what I've read about him, uh, about the decisions he had to make and, uh, how he approached things and the buck stops here. I just love that. It says so much about him, I think, but just an amazing man, amazing family. And you know what? I didn't know your grandfather, but I've gotten to know you the last uh, couple of times we've spoken and you're an amazing man too. And I love what you're doing. And I hope I get to be able to see one of your performances. Well, what, uh, the one, the one you probably have, well, I think you and I talked about how far Cape May was from where you are, but it's Cape May on uh, October 10th. Ah, uh, would you ever be up this way again soon? Long Island on the 22nd at Long Island University. So those are the closest that I'm coming to you anytime soon. And, and the rest just we'll leave up to, uh, we'll leave up to Jeanette and booking and luck and all of that. Well, thank you again. I, I appreciate all you're doing and all the work you're doing to uh, keep your grandfather's memory alive. I wish you and your family the best, and I'll look forward to talking to you again soon, I hope. Thanks, James. This has been fun, and all the best to you and yours. Take care of yourself, and we'll talk again someday, hopefully. All right. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.